Listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast brought to you by DraftKings. Great deal going on right now. You throw down one dollar on an NBA game, and if that team wins, you get one hundred dollars in free plays. It's that simple, that easy. All right, with John Schuster, I am Mike Luke. Thank you for everyone for joining us. We already got some comments. We'll get to those in just a minute. But Schuster, I uh, I messaged you during the game and. Where I think you might be going here, and and you're buffering a little bit, Mike, but we'll try to work our way through it. Am I buffering guessing, right now? Uh, you were you, you were for a moment. We'll hope that it works itself out, and I'll try to cover until it does. How do uh, I sound what, right what, now? You sound good. You sound good, and it's working out great. But I think what you were about to say is how unselfish Arizona ultimately is. And this was another example of that, especially in the second half, Arizona's willingness to move the ball around, get good looks, and the offense played – obviously uh, pretty well tonight. And uh, that wasn't an, a problematic area. Arizona recognized that it had a height advantage, took advantage of that height advantage, uh, on the baseline destroyed Oregon State zone. And even though this is a game with a 14-point final that uh, looked so relatively flat, especially in the first half, when Arizona didn't play particularly well and seemed lazy on the defensive end. I don't think offense by any stretch of the imagination was a problem tonight. Arizona had 44 in the first half and then, uh, you know, went on one of their, I wouldn't say their patented runs necessarily, but something that we've uh, come to expect along the way in the second half and put this game away probably within the first five minutes uh, after intermission. So I'm guessing that maybe Lloyd chewed them out a little bit they got a little bit more um, active on the defensive end, and that was able. That was that that helped to play a role for them to be in a position where they could, you know, pretty easily put this game away. There was a point when they started the second half, and can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're sounding good. Great. All right, I always sound good. But there was a point in the second half, shoe, where you know it was a two point game at the break, and then the Cats get out there and they pushed it to ten, and you knew that that thing was going to be thirty within about. 10 minutes. It didn't hit 30, but you knew that that thing was going to, that, that was the point when the game was going to be over to me at that point. But all right, let's get to a couple comments here. By the way, we've had a couple people mention this Schuster already. Are those Jays behind John Schuster? We've got oh, all, they are. Time. we've got all, t- all game or excuse me, all post game to be able to get to the game. Schuster, explain the Genesis of those pretty hip shoes behind you. Genesis there, but what's that? Most- most uh, people would not associate John Schuster with having v- vintage Michael Jordans. Wouldn't they? From 1994? Wouldn't they? I'm taking offers. You want to make a good offer, I'll be happy to listen. Uh, All right, you guys know. There they are right there. there you guys are. know how to get a hold of him or get a hold of me. All right, shoot. Um, Size 10s. Uh, by the way, uh, I know that you sounding good as a low bar, but nevertheless, you're sounding good. So uh, we're we're in good stead along the way. I thought, generally speaking, Mike, and I think you know, you know pro- probably a lot of the folks in the scroll are feeling the same way as well. Arizona was sort of, I think, lackadaisical defensively right. in the first half. Um, but again, they put up 44, which is when you're usually scoring close to 90, obviously about average for a half. So offense wasn't the problem. Uh, defense you know, wasn't working for Arizona, but in the second half, they obviously did here's a lot what, better job. Here's what makes this team really so good, and there's a lot of things, but this team is so unselfish, and uh, Matt Mulebach, kept, Matty M, kept bringing, uh, bringing it up during the game along with uh, the other commentator, I can't remember his name, and um, talking about this team leads the nation in assists by a good margin, but the unselfishness is also, it looks real. It's not just like a, a, a term out there. These kids generally look like they get excited when the other person scores, and it kind of shows in their play, Shoe. It helps a lot. Uh, and, and, and it's one of those things that, uh, Mike, we've been discussed, uh, d- discussing 
fairly consistently throughout the course of the year is that Arizona gets so many offensive possessions that players and the one who comes to mind the most in this capacity is obviously Ben Matherin. Uh, I think recognize that they're going to get their looks. And, and so it makes being unselfish a little bit easier. Being unselfish, I think, is almost always uh, the better way to go about it. Not always, but more often than not, if you make an extra pass, you're going to be in good shape. And Arizona, additionally, along with, and this is not coincidence, Gonzaga, they are the best two interior passing teams in, I think, college basketball. And it's very often that second pass on the inside that uh, gives them even additional open looks. So, yeah, they have no problem moving the ball around, and it's obviously very effective for a team that understands also how to move without the ball to get open. Why isn't Oregon State better? I'm not saying that they should be a top-five team, but watching this team now from the vantage point of the La Quinta – and uh, watching them a few other times, I'm not saying this is a top 10 team, but this is also a team that shouldn't be 3-21 and 21 either by any means. I mean, they check off a lot of different boxes right there, Shu. I think part of the problem, and you're right, there's no way this should be a three-win team. And one of the things that's fascinating is that we all think Wayne Tinkle is a good coach, I think. But right. we're looking at a team coming off an Elite Eight that looked great in the last three weeks of the season and actually caused mismatch difficulties for people over the last three weeks in the season. Right. But if you take those last three weeks out of the equation, Oregon State was, what, 12th in the conference last year, too. Right. So how good is this program? And based on the talent that they ought to have on that roster, maybe they should be a little bit. They lost a player last year, and I apologize for remembering the name. It's like a Randolph or a Rudolph or a Ethan something Tom- like that. Ethan Thompson? Yeah, that's the guy. Uh, which is exactly like Randolph or Rudolph. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but he was their difference maker. He was he was about six eight. He could jump out of the building. He was so athletic that and defend. He was a defensive stopper, and that allowed Silva to get open. I think on the inside, and without him, that's one less player and problematic depth that makes it difficult. Oregon State hangs around for about thirty minutes, and then, as uh, our regular commenter down below, Sean Seeley noted. Uh, They're a team that just runs out of gas. And when they do, you know, things go against them. I'm betting that in the last 10 minutes of games, Oregon State gets pretty much dominated. Right. Uh, And and that has a lot to do with a lot of depth on that roster. So you look at them for the first 30 and their record makes no sense because you're right. They have some pieces but they just don't have enough of them. And I think the drop-off is pretty precipitous. The reason that uh, we also do this show is to learn from all of you, because quite frankly, a lot of you are smarter than us. Sean Seeley has some inside info from Tommy Lloyd, where he said Tabella's ankle is pretty close to 100%. That's obviously a very good thing to hear, because this can't win it all without uh, without Tabella's. All right. Uh, Got a couple questions here now. Dalen Terry again, and they were talking about this during the game. I, we're kind of at the point now, like I, I've, I've brought this up the last three shows, but I kind of mean it. I mean, that's why I keep bringing it up is that Dalen Terry really is emerged kind of as I know what I'm going to get almost every single game from him. I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I know what I'm going to get you. Yeah. And uh, you take a look at tonight's game. One of the things that he did very effectively uh, additionally was he attacked the rim on the baseline against Oregon State zone. They found an opening. He got uh, uh, around one defender in the corner, uh, took advantage of the baseline, and was able to get to the rack with uh, some fairly impressive dunks in the process. So it was another very solid game. Again, he's got the best court vision on this team. By a mile. In that regard, I, I feel like he is, in essence, a point forward for Arizona or has the ability to be a point forward. You have no problem with Dale and Terry running the break for you. Uh, right. on this team. And and if Arizona can get up and down, he is very instrumental in doing it. And he helps Arizona's transition game. We've talked about the importance of Coloco and Ballo on the inside, allowing Arizona to extend. But Terry, because of that, is the biggest benefactor because he's a guy who can use his wingspan to disrupt passes on the perimeter. And with his ball handling and court vision, usually that's the reason If Arizona is deadly in transition, and very often they are, Dalen Terry is somehow involved in that play. 
Yeah, that's true. That's that's very true. Kirk Creesa, by the way, is somebody that I'm liking more and more what I saw. I don't even know what his stat line is right here, to be quite honest with you. I had asked John Schuster what the final score was, even though I watched the entire game. But I, there's, a, there's a steady right now that I don't know that I've seen before in the season. Um, I, I feel more comfortable watching him. And now maybe that's just because I'm out of state, but – being closer to the situation right there. What do you see, Shu? So if so, so if you're within five mile five mile radius of Kirk Creesa, then, then then there's a little discomfort. But, <laughs> but closer to the some, scene than I am. If you've got some distance, like hey, he's not that bad. Uh I one of the we we had this conversation briefly a show or two ago where I think you asked how comfortable people should be. With Creesa as a three pointer, uh, a three point shooter who averages somewhere in the low 30s. And my answer to right. that, and maybe I didn't necessarily make it clear enough, was that I'd rather have Terry, uh, or rather Creesa, be shoot, uh, shoot three for 10 from three point range as opposed to six for 20. Now, if you, if you extrapolate the percentage of that, obviously it's the same. You're shooting a, you know, a, a, a not very impressive 30%, you're, you're 30% from three point range. That's not very impressive. The difference, however, especially come tournament time is in number of possessions. Uh, so if you have a guy in Creesa, uh, you prefer that he take better shots. He pick his spots. He lines them up, gets into a rhythm and maybe isn't in a position where he takes too many. If he feels Correct. like he exactly. has to take too many, then that's where Arizona maybe is in a possession to have more lost possessions. And those lost possessions become a little bit more precious uh, once you get into the NCAA tournament. So Correct. if you're two for five, if you're three for 10, you know, yeah, you'd obviously like that number to be better. But those num numbers are a heck of a lot better than if Crease is not having a good shooting night, but is shooting into double digits, into the mid-teens, or even a little bit higher in the number of three-pointers that he's ultimately taking. He also is just demonstrating a little bit more of a – I don't know how to put this exactly. I was thinking about this before. A little bit more of a been-there-done-that type. He was a, he was almost calmer tonight. Yes, that's, like what, that's exactly yeah, what I was trying to get. It, it yeah, feels like there's that a too? calming element that oh, over the last two or three weeks that he has uh, developed into his game. So, you know – you, you like the excitement. You like that he isn't afraid to take the shot, but there's a level of maturity and understanding how to play within himself that I think has been very helpful for the fortunes of Arizona across the board. All right. Here's one thing you don't need to worry about. That's the DraftKings Sportsbook app, everyone. Code word PHNX. If you're not on there, what are you doing? All right. Really nice, uh, really nice deal going on right now. You throw down one dollar on an NBA game, and if that team wins, one hundred and fifty dollars in free plays. I kid you not. John Schuster can tell you this. Anybody can testify to this that has actually done it. New customers only. Eligibility. next step all right now let's get to some questions here barrett hartman makes an interesting point he says and I'm, I'm sorry guys i've been very bad about getting to your uh comments we're gonna get to your comments right now barrett hartman makes an interesting point he says tabellus is the most important piece of our offense big difference between having him in versus when we didn't he's so versatile against the man and the zone he is a versatile player because of how he can pass how he can finish he can shoot a little bit i think bear i think barrett makes some very good points there shu there's kind of when, when when offenses function well, there's a trickle down component that works into the equation. And because Tabellus is Arizona's craftiest scorer on the inside, uh, you, you have to be honest about how you defend him. Now, I know there was a game against Michigan where Coloco had over 20 points a game. Right. And I know Ballo is a guy who scored in the upper teens now and again. But the one guy who conceivably can get a basket around the rim on a fairly consistent basis is Tabellus. He right. could score 30. Right. I don't think Coloco's ever going to score 30. I don't think Ballo's going to score 30. But Tabellus could. So you have to make a concerted effort to defend him. And the trickle down from that is how Ben Matherin maybe has better looks. Terry can see the floor a little bit better. Arizona can move the ball around and have good looks from the perimeter. Tabellus helps everything else work just a little bit better. I think the guy who, because he's almost the secondary benefactor from Matherin being the guy that you have to provide a focal point for from 
a defensive scouting report standpoint, because you know Matherin's so potentially explosive. Right. But if you're in a situation where maybe you can double team him because you've got a couple guys like Coloco and Ballo who may be a little bit inconsistent on the inside, or you've got to play a Larson perhaps on the interior, you know that Terry struggles from the perimeter. Tabellus definitely fits and gives Arizona a lot of balance, and it's nice. Uh, Matherin, I think, is the guy who opens it up for Tabellus. Tabellus may be the guy who opens it up for everybody else. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Matherin, to me, is the one player, though, going into a game against a – who you could be playing anybody. You could be playing Kentucky. You could be playing ASU. It wouldn't really matter to me. Matherin kind of controls his own destiny in a way, and that I don't know that there's anybody in the nation that can really stop Matherin if Matherin's playing well just because of the strength, athleticism, skill that he has. There's guys that I think can give Azulis Tabellus some issues out there. Yeah. But again, Tabellus is an all-conference type player. Nobody here is disputing that, and I don't know who whoever is out there that is saying that he stinks. I don't... Well, the good news here, I think, is, is and, and, and it seems apparent, I don't know that... Lloyd necessarily needed to tell Sean that in regards to what we've been able to reserve uh, observe from Tabellus over the course of the last you know few games. Right. It appears that Tabellus has been a lot more comfortable than at the point where he initially messed up the ankle. Right. And that's good news for Arizona. So he continues to progress in the right direction. If you can get him close to 100%, Arizona's in good shape. Yeah, I think it's pretty much that simple right there. I do like KB Field's remark. Daylon Terry can stop Ben. Maybe that uh, maybe that is something yeah, we can worry to... about that at the next level. All right, we uh all right, now let's look at uh, some other uh, some other comments that we got right here. Arizona is and uh, uh Travis Strauss made this point. He said the first half was uh, probably best half a OSU's played all season. I do get the sense that when teams are playing Arizona and this really isn't a this is kind of a, yeah, no dub moment, but Arizona has been able to weather these storms in all these games because you look at it, Oregon State plays one of their best halves of the season, I'm assuming. Washington for about the first 15 minutes. But man, there comes a point though when the good vibes, the energy, the shooting kind of goes out the window and oh yeah, by the way, maybe the best team in the country is right uh, across from us. For Mike and anybody else watching, did you ever believe Oregon State was going to pull off the upset? Never. Not only yeah. that, I didn't. I would have been. I would have been surprised if this wasn't a ten-point victory at any point. Yeah, the it, it was. It was. It was obvious. And Arizona is so good at this stage, and this is this is why they stick with what it is they do. This right. is what they do, and they believe that it's going to wear teams down. It's an interesting. It's an interesting approach and obviously very effective. And it's different than because we heard this conversation, I think, a lot in the previous regime as well. Miller liked to be physical. Miller liked to to wear teams down and, and and try to get an advantage as the game progressed based on Arizona's tough half court defense. Lloyd does it in an entirely different way. They believe that keeping the pressure on from an offensive standpoint and from a tempo standpoint is going to be something that ultimately works for them, and and clearly it does. Right. Uh, Arizona's ability, I think, is game. And it is a number I'd kind of like to look at, and I've meant to look look at it a little bit closer. What's that number again, Shu? And, and unfortunately, it's it's one of those things where in a game like this, where the game's over, the number isn't going to play off as much as I'd like. But my yeah. guess is that Arizona, in at points where it matters, is going to get to a point later in the game where it's clear that they have worn down the opposition. Right. Now, Tonight, Arizona at one point was up, I think, 23 points and won by 14. So if you look at the final nine minutes, which was junk time, that would screw with your overall statistical analytics a little bit. But the point was still there. In the early portion of the second half, it was clear that Arizona had a lot more in the tank than Oregon State, and it was a done deal. You just didn't know what the final margin was going to be. That's going to be a fun thing for Tommy Lloyd. I think Anthony Humber hits on a fascinating point as well, where he says, I don't think anyone beats Arizona when Arizona plays a full locked-in 40. Tommy Lloyd's got to be in a very fun position where he's probably been in this a couple times when he's at Gonzaga, when you know that you kind of control your own destiny. Now, granted, you're going to be, uh, you're not immune to bad shooting nights or, you know, just one of those games, your Utah type game where things just don't work out for whatever reason. But Lloyd goes into practice every day. And I, like I said, there's probably three or four coaches like this in the country knowing that, you know what, if we play the best, no matter who we're playing against, we're probably going to win that game. 
that's got to be a reassuring situation when you're going into film, when you're going into practice, all these spots there, shoot. It gives you a lot of confidence, that's for sure. Now, I suspect that there are going to be games come tournament time where Arizona is going to going to be really nerve wracking because they aren't going to be able to get out in transition. They're going to be able to they're, they're going to face teams that can control on the perimeter. And when you can control and limit turnovers on the perimeter, it becomes a lot more difficult for Arizona to get out and run and open up some of these breaks. And the Cats are going to have to win those games with good de defense and rebounding. But there's going to be that grinded out factor that takes place, and they're going to have to be functional in the half court. So, you know, it's this obviously this is not, I, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago we joked, of, you know, yeah, you think Arizona's the best team in the country right now, and you can certainly favorably argue that they're playing right now better than anybody else. But there are a lot of teams out there with kind of physicality, especially on the perimeter, that can be a problem. And those sorts of teams can make things very close and very arduous, and it's uh, up to Arizona to be able to work through it. I got a question here for John Schuster, but for and this is a good question. A lot of my questions suck. This is a good question. So here, real quick, DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX. That's one thing that doesn't suck. You put down $1 on an NBA game, and if that team wins, you get $150 in free plays. I do feel a little bit, a little bit upset because I told you in the past, pick the Warriors, the Warriors have lost two of their last three games since I said that. So maybe don't pick the Warriors. Pick uh, um, work in the opposite direction. If just I work in the opposite direction. May, may, may I interject here? Of course. Starting next week after the NBA All Star break, when you start to get teams trying to separate, even though they won last night, pick against the Pistons. Pick against the Pistons, and oh by the way, pick against the Pistons. You want Detroit to play about 300 games this year so that you can make money picking against the Pistons. That's simple. On the DraftKings Sportsbook app. DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX. Bet against the Pistons. And Sean Seeley with another little tidbit right here. The Bucks cover a lot. Okay. So right now, I don't really want to talk anymore about Oregon State. They stink, and Arizona was able to roll them. If you were a team, Schuster, and I wrote an article about this, and I'm curious to see what you have to take on this. If you're a team, and let's say that you're not quite as good as Arizona. Well, Arizona's a top-five team in the country. Let's say you're coming in with a top – you're going to play them top 15, 20 teams or something like that. You're not as good as Arizona. You're basically kind of a poor man's version at each position, but you're obviously really good. What would your game plan be to try to stifle and beat Arizona? Man, that's uh, well, your first order of business and a lot of and this is no secret. You try to take a you hope that you have a player who can take advantage of Crease on the defensive end. Uh and because that is Arizona's most clear defensive right. liability. And you hope that that mismatch can then open up some other things where you know, you can get into a bit of a rhythm and make things interesting. Uh, from there, on the defensive end, you try to be physical with Coloco, push him out of his spot. That becomes a little bit difficult, obviously, for Ballo. But with Coloco's a guy who can make a little bit uncomfortable. If Arizona goes on the inside, you double team Coloco quickly because sometimes he takes a little bit of time right. to, and is a bit indecisive on what it is you can ultimately do. If you have a bigger guy, you try to put him on Matherin just to try to balance that out and make him struggle a little bit. Uh, and but but again, you've got to be able to hold your own from a rebounding standpoint and limit and and limit Arizona in transition. But those are probably the two or three approaches that I'd try to utilize against Arizona to see how ultimately effective I can be before this, before the rise of Ballo. And Ballo makes such a big difference here. My strategy would have right, been right. I know where you're going with this. Yeah. I know where you're going with you that. Yeah. Coloco and try to get him into foul trouble because Coloco has a tendency to make bad fouls or get into a position where he gets fouls called against him, whether he commits them or not. Sometimes, and if Coloco is out of the game pre ballo then you've got a very different situation where Arizona's a lot more yeah. mortal. Yeah. But now with the rise of Ballo. That's not a strategy that may be as effective because he can come in and be just as good. And, and the benefit of him stepping up makes Arizona so much more difficult than I think we thought they would have been two or three months ago. Do you think that Arizona, 
assuming they're a one seed, which I think is probably pretty close, pretty fair assumption. So you're playing a 16 and then you're playing an eight or a nine. Does Arizona have a fir- like a moderately close game in the first weekend of the NCAA tournament? Um, I would lean toward no more than yes. Right. Uh, obviously the 16 is a game that Arizona wins by 40 or 50. Uh, but, and, and I'm not, and I'm not making up that number. I think they'd beat a 16 by 40 or 50. By the way, uh, real quick, ahead. look at KB Fields. The rise of Ballo sounds like a war movie. <laughs> it really does. And where's our pal Chad's tonight? Who's supposed to chime in and say, I told you, I yes. told you, Ballo yes. was awesome. He's yes. the best. I told you. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm bummed. <laughs> this is a perfect opportunity for that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, uh, against an eight or a nine. Uh, depending on, you know, I, if Arkansas is an eight. Right. That could, yeah, that could be a close game and a real problem, a real test for Arizona. So there are some teams, you know, like an athletic SEC team, I think could be a, a real issue for Arizona. Maybe there's a team in the middle in the big 12 that you look at and say, Ooh, you know, perhaps, but I think Arizona looks like a team that has positioned itself very well and is playing at a level of confidence where they should be into the second weekend of the tournament and should be a favorite heading into that game against what you would anticipate, you know, would be a four or a five. Yeah, I think that's about right. I think that's about right. Trust in Ballo. Um, All right. So looking ahead real quick, Oregon's coming to town tomorrow or on Saturday. Who really knows what to expect there? Some games they look great. Some games they look like crap. I'm at the point now with them where I don't believe in them. And you know what? After the California blowout, meh, I'm good. Well, and uh, you got to show me from here. Right I'm now, out. We're doing this live. Okay. Yes. So for folks who are listening later, you know the outcome of this. Oregon is losing to ASU at the half. Correct. That is a huge game for Oregon. Right. Uh, because if you're trying to make a statement, I'm a, I'm a believer in the Ducks because I, I, I still, oh, you backed that, it with the DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX. I, I still fig, I still believe that, you know, Altman's going to get this figured out and, and Oregon's going to be a real problem, get into the tournament and just be a monster. Uh, but time's running out for them. Right. And, and if you're trying to make the case, uh, with losses back to back to California and ASU, that that completely wipes away winning on the road at USC and UCLA. Right. And that's not something that right now, I mean, I, I test Oregon and I think Oregon's in the field. I right. don't I, I, I think Joe Lenardi's nuts. Right. Uh, and, and I think, again, somehow, even though the Pac-12 had such a good year in the tournament last year, the conference is largely undervalued. Uh, and I, I think there are some some large conference teams out there who are on the eight line and the nine line and the seven line and the 11 line that if they had the same record in the Pac-12, Lenardi would have them out of the tournament. Right. Um, I, I test Oregon and say when they get their act together, forget it. They're a mess. But admittedly, after they peaked against the L.A. schools, they've leveled off quite a bit. So maybe this is what they are, a fringe bubble team, but I'd hate to see them. And hate to play in a one game I, proposition. And I still believe they're going to get this righted and going to get in the field and be a real mess before it's all said and done. Guys, sorry, we're going to sign off a little bit early today. I'm going to be um, getting out and uh, I'm going to be moving back to Tucson here shortly. I'll still be coming to you from the La Quinta Saturday, but that'll be the last one. Again, appreciate all of you. Go to go PHNX. Get the membership. You get a free Back the A t-shirt. It was asked earlier. Go on there. Back the A t-shirts are still there. John Schuster, as always, I appreciate you, especially at the beginning, helping me with the buffering. You guys are all the best out there. I will be back with you Saturday. And then the next uh, broadcast, I will be back in lovely Tucson. But for John Schuster, I'm Mike Luke. Thanks again. You've been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. Thank you.